Good morning, everybody. It's so nice to see you all here in person. You can feel things changing in our city. Our schools are open. Restaurants, stores are getting busy. Even offices are showing, are starting to show signs of coming back to life. Hell, we're back at the Hilton, which is exciting. With every day, it feels more normal to be in a room like this with everyone vaccinated. New Yorkers, our communities, are truly showing the rest of the country how to cope with whatever the pandemic throws at us. And down in D.C., our government is finally back in the infrastructure business. The rate of change is picking up, and our optimism is picking up. As we come back together, really like different than we were 20 months ago, the change that we have all experienced, I have to say, speaks to fundamental principles embedded in the core of our Abney community. Grit, love of community, optimism, appreciation, belief in collaboration, hard work, and a desire to do better. All of which also begins to describe our speaker today, the first woman governor of our state, Kathy Hochul. At Abney, we share Governor Hochul's belief that working together to care for our neighborhoods and our communities makes our city and our state strong. In that spirit, Abney has been looking for new ways we could support local business and local communities. So we made a decision to transfer some of our banking to community banks, banks that invest directly in small businesses that are the lifeblood of our neighborhoods, including women and minority-owned businesses, as well as small enterprises still hurting from the pandemic. We now bank at three amazing New York institutions, Abacus Federal Savings Bank, Carvel Federal Savings Bank, and Ponce Bank. The Abney Foundation will earn interest and know our funds are secure. At the same time, these critical institutions will loan money to small businesses in our city that need it to survive and to thrive. So this is literally a win-win for, for us and, and, and hopefully for them. Two of our partners who lead these banks are here with us today. Jill Sung, the CEO of Abacus, who's also an Abbey trustee. And Michael Pugh, the president and CEO of Carver. We're proud to bank with all of them, and we hope that many of you will consider doing some of your banking with them as well. I'd like to take a moment to welcome the public servants, the elected officials who are here with us this morning. Our Lieutenant, Go oh, please hold your applause until the end. <laughs> Our Lieutenant Governor Brian Benjamin is here, State Senators Brad Hoyleman and Brian Kavanaugh, Assembly Members Lisa Heineman and David Weprin, Queens District Attorney Melinda Katz, and Council Members Keith Powers and Council Member-Elect Marjorie Velasquez. Thank you all for being here. All right, now onto the reason we are all here. As I said, many of Abney's values are embodied in our speaker today. Values and quality, qualities like hard work and grit. Governor Hochul has risen to the highest office in the state from humble beginnings. Maybe not a log cabin, but pretty close. Her parents started out in a mobile home, and she worked four nights a week through high school, long hours making pizzas and chicken wings, as well as babysitting. Her boss tried to fire her for going to her high school graduation. The boss said, and in this I quote Cindy Adams, piss on that, shut up or you're fired. Well, she did not do the former, and he did not dare do the latter. Kathy Hochul knew her boss needed her. She worked hard, and she did the job well. That work ethic, even in the face of adversity, has defined her career in public service ever since. Next, there are values like collaboration, an ethic our Abney community deeply believes in. Governor Hochul shares that belief as well. She pledged to work with our city. And now, for the first time in a long time, we have our governor and our mayor, and even our mayor-elect, actually talking to each other, working together on our future. <laughs> One last shared value. At Abney, we love leaders who get it done. It's been three months since the governor was sworn in, and she has hit the ground running. Let's not forget what was going on in August when she was sworn in as governor. The Delta variant was surging, students and educators were just days away from resuming in-person learning, and the expected Labor Day return to office had sputtered, putting our economic recovery in jeopardy. 
but she did not miss a beat. She provided clear guidance and tools so schools could reopen safely. She put in place vaccination mandates that save lives. Today, nearly 90% of, of adults in our state are vaccinated, and New York City has one of the lowest infection rates in the entire nation. She cut red tape in the state's emergency rental assistance program, got it back on track, propelling New York from last to first, getting money to tenants so they could make the rent. She signed legislation that expanded paid family leave. She quickly put her stamp on a revitalized Penn Station, getting one of the region's most important infrastructure priorities back on track, pun intended. She boosted New York City's comeback with a $450 million bring back tourism, bring back jobs recovery package, marketing our city globally. And she's built a team around her of people who we at Abney know for their integrity, for their talent, and for their civic commitment. Three months in, here's what we can say about Governor Hochul. She rolls up her sleeves, she puts governance, integrity, and transparency first, and she is getting the job done. Governor, we at Abney stand ready to help and hope you call on us to help. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the 57th Governor of State of New York, Kathy Hochul. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for the introduction and reminder of how not just my family, but many families started with humble beginnings. And I see many of their successes in this room. And I thank all of you as part of Abney for being there when we needed you the most. And Melva, I had a chance to work with you closely uh, when I spent, it seems like, every day of my life in Queens with uh, Melinda Katz when she was borough president and now our district attorney, and to all the elected officials who've joined us here today. But 50 years, Abney, congratulations. That is outstanding. You know, it seems like whenever we're in trouble, we need Abney. Look back exactly 50 years ago and the names of the families that you heard here who are just legendary and viewed as the dreamers and the doers for generations. But back then, when Abney was born during the financial crisis of the 70s, a lot of people gave up on New York City. That is a statement of fact. It had fallen so far financially and the crime and just people saying it's just not working. But Abney was created by true believers, business leaders, labor leaders, civic leaders who never ever gave up on the promise of New York City. So today, Abney, you are called once again to help us lead our way out of this pandemic and into a better future. So I thank you. I thank you, Abney, for being there. In a time right now, yes, we feel the optimism in this room. I feel the energy. I love to see it. But there are people questioning our future and what it will look like. In this moment, there's a lot of people saying, can we really get through this? But my friends, this is not a moment to despair. It is a moment to seize the great possibilities that lie before us. And we will reimagine the post-pandemic world in a way that only the dreamers and doers of New York City are capable of. My vision for New York is bold. Post-pandemic, we rebuild, but also we unlock New York's incredible potential. Incredible potential. Now is the time to make transformative investments in infrastructure, public safety, and find new pathways to jobs for those who are unemployed, but also in those industries where there's a severe shortage of workers. We have to address these as our highest priorities. And Stephen mentioned uh, one, I guess, rather obvious fact, first female governor of New York. Yes, I, I understand the weight of my shoulders to be successful. And to all the women in this room, there's one fact that we all know is true. Women are held to higher standards. Are we not, my sisters? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. But it also gives us a chance to not meet those standards, but exceed those standards. And that is what I intend to do as your governor. And how are we going to do this? I will govern with strength, but also compassion. 
And I'm ushering in a whole new era of collaboration based on the model of Abney, which you've always done for these 50 years, bringing people together to solve problems. And it's no longer about who gets the credit. It's about who gets it done. It's that simple. And I'm sharing success. Shared success, what does that actually mean? It's something I'm hardwired to do. And for longtime observers, politics and government in the city, it may seem a bit radical. It's how I've governed for the last two and a half months here, but my entire life. So get used to a whole new era of collaboration. I work with local leaders, for example. I come out of local government. I know what it was like as a local government official, counselor for 14 years, and all we did was say, why is Albany doing this to us? Don't they hear us? Don't they understand that we're the closest form of government to the people? But for far too long, we've not listened to their voices. I've worked with them, starting from day one with the pandemic, saying, I'm not going to dictate to you how to handle this in your community. You get it right, and I'll support you. You need some help? I'm there to back you up. And they so appreciated being empowered, local governments, a whole new era of cooperation. I worked across state boundaries. Just recently, we had a big challenge. He said, there's a big log jam out there. There's billions of dollars of federal money for, for transit. It was a log jam because there could not be an agreement between New York and Connecticut and New Jersey. My God, how could this ever happen? I said, really? It's that hard? Uh, Phil? How you doing? Let's watch football together and let's solve this. Uh, there are simple ways to get this done. And to my former colleagues in Congress, who I stood with on the White House lawn on a rather chilly day on Monday, witnessing history being made when President, President Biden put pen to paper and literally with the stroke of a pen was able to ensure the long-term viability of our state's in our country with $1.2 trillion of infrastructure dollars. And that is extraordinary. I worked as a staffer for Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan when he served on the Infrastructure Committee. We talked about these big projects. And now, so many of them that have some have been accomplished, but so many have been waiting. We can get that done. But I said to my friends in Congress, as we talked about this, New Day, when I go to your districts and announce the projects that will be funding you will be standing next to me. They were stunned. I was a member of Congress. This never happened. But it's about shared success and lifting everyone up. And I so look forward to working with our incoming mayor, Eric Adams. He will say, have you met the mayor yet? I've been working with him for seven years. What do you think I did as lieutenant governor? Clearly, I've worked with him. I know these people. I know every inch of this state. I know every elected official. I've been everywhere. And I know Eric Adams and we have shared values and a vision to bring this city and this state to a far better place. And as I said on election night, as I stood on the stage with Eric Adams, I said, the era where the New York State governor is fighting with the New York City mayor is over, and instead we'll roll up our sleeves and fight for the people. It's that simple. We can get that done. How do I know I'll be successful? Well, first of all, I've assembled the dream team of all dream teams. Yes, I have. I have. Uh, first of all, to my Lieutenant Governor, Brian Benjamin, who's here. I want to thank him for saying yes. He is going to champion small businesses, making sure that our NYCHA buildings are better than they are, and focusing on the needs of the communities. And I want to thank him for his leadership. Uh, my brilliant secretary to the governor, Karen Tadili Kio. You know her as KPK. Karen, thank you. Thank you for saying yes, Karen. Thank you. Counsel to the governor, Liz Fine. People know her work at ESD, an extraordinary leader. Chief of Staff, Jess Lewis. You've gotten to know him over the years. Director of Transition, Marissa Shorenstein. Budget Director, Robert Mojica. ESD Commissioner Hope Knight started Monday. My nominee to be Chair of ESD is Kevin Law, sitting over here as well. <laughs> Superintendent of Department of Financial Services, the top regulator on Wall Street, is a woman, a woman of color who has extraordinary experience in Barack Obama's administration. Adrienne Harris, she's going to do a phenomenal job. My Secretary of State, Robert Rodriguez. And when things get really tough, 
I call out New York City's fixer, State of Operations Director, Catherine Garcia. So I can just go home. <laughs> Let me take a few moments to lay out my priorities. I'll tick them off and then I'll develop them a little bit further. First of all, we bring people back to work, particularly to their offices right here in Midtown. We connect people to jobs and address the racial disparities and the barriers to people's success, especially for our young emerging entrepreneurs who just need access to capital. We're going to fight for that as well. And we're going to make infrastructure investments that will create transportation equity as well as environmental justice. Yes, that is something we can accomplish together. And I know when I think about racial justice, and I can't help but think of someone who's in this room, and that is the leader, the fighter for justice for decades, and that is Hazel Dukes, my adopted mother, the head of the NAACP. So how do we bring people back? Well, clearly you got the memo. You're missing a good game if you're sitting in your pajamas, zooming in your basement. I mean, this is, this is where the action is, is it not, my friends? There's such a vitality out there. I literally walk the streets of New York every single day. State police might not be as thrilled about it, but I literally walk up to people, and I look at me in the eye, how are you doing, what's going on? I walk into businesses, I walk into the tall buildings, and I say, what is going on here? How are you feeling? People coming back. This has been a devastating impact on our economy, the fact that, yes, we're still fighting this pandemic, but people need to know that in a place like New York City, the infection rate is 1%. People are vaccinated. They're getting their booster shots. They're wearing masks, walking down the street, even when they're not required to. They're doing all the right things in the city. It is safe to come back. Send that message out to your employees. Come back to work. We miss you. Because we know the effect on the small subsidiary businesses, the little mom and pop shops, the retail, the places people stop for coffee and for lunch, all those little businesses are also hurting until people come back downtown. I'm going to put a stake in the ground right now. You heard that we're all going to be back New Year's Eve celebrating. I look forward to being there as well for that ball to drop on a whole new, whole new year that I just can't wait to put 2020, 21 behind us. But how about this New Year's resolution? that in the days after New Year's, that we say, everybody back in the office, you can have a flex time, but we need you back at least the majority of the week. Come on back, New Yorkers, we miss you. And we will do our part. We will do our part. I know there's some anxiety, for example, about taking the subway. Only half the people are on the subway. First of all, it's easy to get a seat right now. Uh, you don't have to stand. But as MTA Acting Chair and CEO Jana Lieber, and Jano, by the way, I'm really looking forward to dropping the word acting soon. Okay, can we just make this permanent? <laughs> Jana Lieber, extraordinary leader. But just to say to people, we understand your hesitation. We have promised no planned service disruptions and no fare increase for the rest of this year and next year. Let's get that done. Don't worry, Jana, I'll find the money somewhere. <laughs> we also have to make people feel safe on the subways, on the streets. Yeah, I, I, I walked around, I know people have this inner anxiety. They're feeling it's not quite the way it was before the pandemic. This was known as the safest city in America, safest big city in America, just 20 months ago. But I'll tell you, my friends, New York City has faced crime before. We've overcome it. And the fact that this was not a long slump into crime, it's a short spike downward, which means we can pop up quickly. And working with the city of New York, the new mayor, this is how we're going to get it done. I also recognize that we have a humanitarian crisis in our streets. You cannot ignore this. No human being can walk over someone lying on a street or seeing them in a park and not feeling this tug of anxiety saying, this is not right in the greatest city on this planet in the 21st century. This is not right. We need to connect the homeless to support of housing, address their needs, whether it's mental health services, substance abuse services. These people have needs. We need to take care of them and tell them, this is not your home. We can do better than this. But I also understand the anxiety of families. I was walking the Upper West Side 
just did last weekend, a week, couple weekends ago, and I saw this couple and their two little girls, and they came up to me and said, are you really the governor? I said, I, I get that a lot. <laughs> oh, yes, I said, yes, I am the governor. They said, you know what, we stayed here during the pandemic. A lot of our friends left. They went off to safer places. We kept our kids here. We did not want to give up on the city. But now we're just feeling the problem of worrying about things. It's just, it's starting to get to us. Are you going to help us? I said, yes, I'm going to help you. I understand that anxiety to my core. I understand the anxiety of tourists who may be thinking about this. I need to tell them loudly and clearly that we are tackling this, we will get through this, and New York is a great place to come, and we want you here. And I've also heard from various landlords in the areas. They talk to me all the time. I hear everything. They also tell me they want to help with these crises. They want to help us with crime. They want to help us with the homeless problem. That is the kind of partnership that ABNY can deliver with state government to work collaboratively to get this done. We also cannot ignore that there's a gun violence epidemic raging in our streets. And it's not just New York City. I had to send extra resources up to Rochester and Buffalo and Syracuse and other cities. And this is a national problem. I don't want to say there's something that we're doing wrong here in New York. This is a national problem. But my heart breaks as a mother to know that black children are 10 times more likely to die from gun violence than a white child. That's not right. That's not right. I've taken a number of actions. I've extended the executive order to declare this a statewide emergency, which allows me to deploy more resources. Just this past week, I signed a bill to ban ghost guns. You all read about the ghost guns. How is it possible that someone could manufacture a lethal weapon in their home and go out and use it and not be traced? That is over. I also joined with a mutual pact with Connecticut, New Jersey, Pennsylvania to sign an MOU that will work together to track the guns because the federal government just won't do it. Okay, get out of the way, we'll do it ourselves. And we're gonna have information sharing resources as well. I just announced a State Firearm Violence Research Institute, something the legislature's wanted for a long time, but nobody wanted to actually quantify what's happening, why is it happening, where is it happening. Let's get that da data so we can have a more targeted approach. This is what you call common sense gun safety legislation because it's crucial, crucial that we make the city safe for those who live here, those who work here, and those who visit here. Priority number two is to get the economy back on fire. We know how to do this. This is what we do best. We are the innovators, the creators, the believers, and we have to create the jobs of the future because right now we have this huge disconnect. And I saw this when I was in Congress. I used to bring together the leaders of my local colleges, community colleges in particular, bring them together with the leaders of the businesses and say, would you please talk to each other? Because I have a feeling things are being taught over here that are not exactly relevant to the workforce and your need to have talent. We're gonna continue doing that even more. And what I wanna do is recognize the areas where we have a labor shortage. And it is real, it is real. But also the unemployment numbers continue to be high. So this is the challenge, but I also know how to get there. We'll give people new skills that are linked to the jobs that are existing, but also the jobs of the future. I know how education and training can lift people out of poverty. My very poor grandparents fled Ireland because they had nothing. Their parents basically said, leave because we can no longer feed you. Our family is too big. They came to America as teenagers. And grandpa starting out working as a migrant farm worker in the fields of South Dakota, heard there were great jobs in a place called Lackawanna, Buffalo, New York. And so, I'm thinking, too bad the jobs weren't someplace warmer. <laughs> <laughs> I love Buffalo. <laughs> hey, if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. There's, there's, there's nobody stronger than me out there. Uh, grandpa, grandma and grandpa started life and lived the American dream because they worked at a steel plant. Grandpa worked at steel plant. Grandma worked at Bell Aerospace making parts for our planes during World War II. But what that did was give a gift to my father. Yes, you heard my father and mother started out in a trailer park. I visited there two weeks ago to just to get that sense of what it was like to live in this tiny trailer with a newborn baby, my, my brother by ear. And then they moved into a little flat close to the steel plant when I was born. I never even knew we didn't have anything. You just live in that world, you don't know. But what transformed my family was the fact that my father was able to get a college degree at night while working at the steel plant. Otherwise, I would have had a very different outcome. My whole family would have. 
So I believe to my core the value of education and training and linking people to the jobs that are there because our employers need it as well. This is something we will accomplish. And we're going to be working closely with CUNY and SUNY and finding that pathway to the middle class for many more people who have been left behind, particularly those who lost their jobs that may not be coming back. Not all the jobs are coming back as a result of this pandemic. Businesses are doing things differently. Many will, some will not. I want to capture people before they fall too far. And we cannot afford a labor shortage in areas like health care. Look at how we honored the health care workers. We banged pots and pans. We celebrated them. We called them heroes because we are living in the security of our homes and they're running into the line of fire every single day to save lives. As a result, so many of them were burned out. They were close to retirement and they just said, okay. And they truly deserve our undying respect and gratitude. But as a result, this pandemic came down hard on them. We now have a severe shortage in health care workers. This cannot be because there are people that are waiting for medical, life-saving medical attention who may not get it. Before that happens in our state, I'm taking an action today, which is to announce that we'll be funding the education of 1,000 New Yorkers to make sure they're trained as nurses and get them into our system as soon as possible. So we're getting, making sure we can get these RNs out there. We'll get them trained at our CUNY schools and our SUNY schools. 1,000 New Yorkers to take care of New Yorkers. And we'll give people the other skills they need. I, I could go on forever, but I'm real excited about our green energy economy, what we're going to do out in Long Island, getting jobs for people who never dreamed they'd be working, helping in establish New York State as the epicenter of the offshore wind systems, and it's going to be powerful. But I, that's another speech I have so much to talk about. <laughs> Wait for my state of the state. Infrastructure. What does infrastructure mean? Think about that. What does it mean to you? Is it just a road? Is it a bridge? It's also what you don't see, it's underground too, and how important that is. And I have such gratitude as the governor of the state of New York to President Joe Biden, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, Speaker Nancy Pelosi, and all the courageous individuals who voted to make sure we have the money we need to make up for neglect from the past. We have been given a once in a lifetime opportunity to take that money on top of what we already have and to spend it. I like to spend money, get used to it. We're gonna do this all over. But we're gonna make New York more livable. That's what I'm talking about. What does infrastructure really mean? As Lieutenant Governor, you ready for this Lieutenant Governor? Traveled around the earth 15 times, mile-wise, okay? Okay, get ready. <laughs> 370,000 miles traveled around the state of New York. So I have a personal encounter with every single pothole, every bump in the road. I know this state like the back of my hand. So I'm putting $1 billion toward a brand new repaving program to fix the potholes. This is a quality of life issue for people to say, why, why do I have to deal with this? $1 billion to harden our road and bridge infrastructure. I don't want to live in a state where there are bridges that are compromised. We have to use this money and use it now. And what we saw after Hurricane Ida, never again do I want to witness the pain and anguish when literally days into my job as coming governor, I walked the streets of East Elmhurst, saw people whose lives were destroyed because the infrastructure could not withstand the record rains that fell from the heavens. People lived in basement homes. They were literally captive, flooded, and drowned in their homes. And I saw a little girl and her mom sitting out in the curb with a basin, trying to scrub her little shoes to get them, the mud off of them because she had nothing to wear, and her shoes were all covered and caked in mud. Never again. We're going to build the resiliency, the infrastructure, above ground, underground, to protect the people of New York because Mother Nature seems to be really mad at us these days. Uh, two hurricanes in my first couple weeks as governor, we have seen, we had more hurricanes than the state of Florida did this year. My father lives in Florida. He's kind of gloating over this right now. He's, so we have to be prepared. And that, after that experience, I told my team, I have to be mentally prepared for a hurricane every 10 days at this rate. That's what we were dealing with. And shame on us if we're not prepared. This infrastructure money will help us get there. But those of you who really don't like the potholes that are until we get a chance to fix them, you know how you avoid potholes? 
You take the train, right? You take the train. No potholes on the train tracks, right, Jeno? So just acting like a regular New Yorker, I drop my daughter off one day at Penn Station and say, oh my God, I hope I see you again. I love you dearly. <laughs> uh, that should not be the experience of people living in the greatest city on this planet. I think we can all agree with that. So I look into this, find out that there's a plan to do Penn Station after the Gateway Tunnel's done. If we're lucky, we start in 2035, maybe 2040. And I'm thinking, how old am I going to be for this ribbon cutting? <laughs> I said, New Yorkers deserve this. Let's make New York better for New Yorkers and enhance the commuter experience. And so the mom who's coming in from Long Island who gets up at the crack of dawn, picks the kids' sandwich, makes the kids' sandwiches, get them off school, travels in darkness because the days are too short, comes up through Penn Station, no longer should be encountered more darkness, more depression. It'll be beautiful. You'll look up and you'll see the heavens and say, yes, there is a God. They fixed Penn Station. <laughs> it's going to be extraordinary. It's all about the experience. I want people to feel good about themselves. Being a commuter should not be a drudgery experience. A drudgery. We can do better than that. Also, quality of life issues, time. The most precious thing we have is time. And we saw this during the pandemic when people actually rediscovered their children, <laughs> took them outside. They realized there's more than just work. You have a wonderful family that's happy to see you. I can give you back 40 days, 40 minutes in your day with the east side access. If you come in through Jamaica Station, you come into Grand Central, it not only will be a beautiful experience again, artwork on the walls, beautiful corridors, it's magnificent. Jano and I were put on, I still got to wonder why they put you and I on the test drive a couple weeks ago. <laughs> what does that say about how we're valued by your organization, Jano? Just say, <laughs> yeah, let's have the governor and uh, Jano, you test drive and see if it's going to crash or not. <laughs> It didn't crash. Uh, it was magnificent. About one year from now, we'll take that ride and we'll welcome people to a whole new experience that literally saves 40 minutes in your day. That's precious. Make sure you spend that time with your kids. All right. And because Harlem's in the house, I have to talk a little Harlem, Hazel. Uh, Second Avenue Subway, phase two. How long are we gonna talk about this one? Since the 1940s, they've been talking about this. Okay, team, time to get it done. Long promise, wildly overdue. I'm today announcing we will make good on that promise. We will have no more excuses with this infrastructure, with these infrastructure dollars. Tomorrow, I'll be there with Congressman Espaillat, who's been talking about this. We will right the wrongs of the past here and in so many other places where. People in the past had this idea that the best way to put, best place to put a highway was right smack dab in the middle of black and brown communities because, my God, they won't complain. That was wrong. We are going to do the, <laughs> fix the Cross Bronx Expressway, reconnect communities, just like they're doing in Syracuse, where I went to school with the I-81, another divided community. We fix it in Rochester. We'll do that here in the city. That's what transportation equity looks like. And that is going to be a hallmark of my administration. Big regional projects. These are the ones we get all excited about. Working with the executive director of the Port Authority, Rick Cotton, who's just a brilliant individual. Love working with Rick. We're going to reimagine our airports and our ports and everything else under the jurisdiction. And I will tell you, we talk about the regional cooperation with New Jersey. I was at the Bills-Jets game last week. <laughs> okay, don't say anything. <laughs> but I know the Jets know a lot about infrastructure because they've been in the midst of a 50-year rebuilding project. <laughs> but, 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 being a Buffalo Bills fan, it took us at least 32, okay? So I, I get this, okay? There is hope, my teams. I love, I'm a mom of all this, this whole state. I love my... Giants and Jets and Bills. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to get in so much trouble. Uh, <laughs> but seriously, important projects with New Jersey. I mean, we're not at war with New Jersey. They're our friends. 
Many of them work in our city. They're spending money here. That's a good thing. They're welcome here. They're part of the family. Gateway, way too many holdups. Way too many holdups. Come on. Sometimes you just need an adult in the room who walks in and say, stop fighting. I raise teenagers. I'm really good at this. <laughs> we can do this. And there's a shared interest in accomplishing. We'll get the governance strategy down. We'll also work on the Port Authority bus terminal. OK, buses, we want to bring people in and make them feel safe and secure and, again, an, an enlightened experience. We can get that done as well. Infrastructure is also the key to unlock our opportunities to protect our environment. We authorized brand new transmission lines from upstate in Canada. People said, here's the choice, hydroelectric power coming down along the Hudson from Hydro-Quebec. That's a good thing for New York City. The other plan is you could bring in wind and solar from the Catskill region. Nice projects, you could pick one or the other. Uh, we decided, no, we're in a crisis. We'll do both at the same time. Let's just get that done. Let's make those investments now so we can close the fossil fuel generated power plants in the New York City that are creating health problems for our kids. That's what this is about. That's what environmental justice looks and feels like. We're, as I mentioned, we're gonna focus on offshore wind, Thousands and thousands of jobs will be coming from that industry. We have plans for a $3 billion bond act to create jobs, but also clean energy infrastructure. $3 billion, I said, you know, after two hurricanes, I'm going to up that to $4 billion. But tell me, first of all, the cost per family a year. This is how I think. So if we go from $3 billion to $4 billion, how much will New, York ha New Yorkers have to pay? Uh, $37 a year. Hmm. That's the cost of my dinner for two at Shake Shack last night where I had a shake and a veggie burger. Um, I think we can afford that. I think every family is willing to pay $37 a year to protect the environment for the future. I think we can agree on that. So we're going to do that next year. And I need your support. I need your support. We'll also transition to electric buses so all the parents who are very anxious about dropping their, having their kids picked up in a bus that is spewing pollution and in their little lungs I'm a mom again. I drop my kids off at a school bus. I cannot wait for the advent of electric buses uh, all throughout the state, school buses and otherwise. As you know, we banned the sale of gas-powered vehicles in 2035. Okay. Did you get that memo? <laughs> okay. okay, those of you who are antique car holders, I'll, I'll let it slide a little bit. But we, we banned the sale of, of gas-powered vehicles. So what does that mean? We have to start building the infrastructure now for the electric charging stations. I want to be certain that no one will ever question or ever hesitate about driving an electric vehicle because that's the, those are the vehicles of the future. I don't want them to worry about whether or not they'll get that charge. So wherever I see a gas pump, I'm envisioning a charging station right there. Let's get started. We're going to need that much time. That's what environmental justice looks like as, all, as well. Well, I could, fill, I, mean, I, I could fill a buster all day. I have so much to share with you, and I'm so excited about this. But You'll see it in my State of the State address. We're working on that now. And I look forward to many, many, many years coming back as your governor addressing ABNY because we have so much to do. I've talked a lot about the future. But just to close, I want to talk for a minute about the past. And Melva alluded to this. I know we will emerge victorious from this pandemic, stronger and better because it's in our DNA as New Yorkers. We can't help it. We can't help but think about the possibilities and have that eternal sense of optimism. We persevere and we come back stronger. What happened 100 years ago? The last pandemic brought us to our knees. Thousands of people died. What happened? We persevered and we came back stronger. We actually launched into the Roaring Twenties, if you ignore 1929. It was a very good decade. It was a very good decade. <laughs> After the Great Depression, what do we do? We persevered and we came back stronger. What do we do after the fiscal crisis? Abney, you were born in during the fiscal crisis. We persevered and we came back stronger. 9-11, persevered and came back stronger. Superstorm Sandy, we fought back, we persevered, we came back stronger. It's all we know how to do. What do we do now? You know the answer. We persevere and we come back stronger. And I have one question for you. Are you with me to persevere and come back stronger, New York, and show the rest of the world that, yes, we did come back, 
New York came back. There's no stopping us. And show the world what New York exceptionalism looks like. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, everybody, we've got a few minutes for questions, and then we'll get you out of here on time. Thank you, Governor. You are clearly busy, and that is awesome to see. Thank you. All right, we have a few questions from the crowd. Uh, oh, my former chairman, Bill Rudin. Governor, wow, what a speech. That was incredible. And I, I, I had a lot of questions, but I think you answered them all. But uh, first of all, congratulations. We wish you the best of luck, and we will be with you as you uh, endeavor to bring our city and state back. And you can always see uh, many of the uh, uh, ideas and efforts that you and your team have put together uh, come to fruition. We were talking before uh, about the uh, people coming back to work uh, and getting uh, the booster. Uh, you and the mayor were very forward-thinking this week, announcing uh, allowing uh, people 18 to 65 to get their booster shot. Can you talk a little bit about that and how you think that will help get people back into the offices, which you talked about before as really a key to getting our economy going? Thank you, Bill. Yes, um, I'm impatient. I didn't want to wait any longer because we know boosters are working and as someone who didn't quite qualify for 65, but creeping up on that, I also realize that there's a lot of people who need the security of knowing that just in case their efficacy of the vaccine starts waning, and the reality is it does wane somewhat after six, seven, eight months, that people who were vaccinated one year ago, and primarily in January, February, March, we need to make sure that they're boosted up. I mean, that's the premise behind this. Give them that booster shot. So there's a lot of hesitation out there. I just said, let me just be clear. If you feel at risk, and I'd say anybody living in the state of New York is at risk, but if you feel at risk, you have the ability to go into your doctor's office and say, I want that booster's office, go into a pharmacy, let's make that happen. And Bill, you and I were talking about another dynamic that is not experienced here in the city. I commend the people of New York City for doing what is right, People got vaccinated, they're getting their children vaccinated. I was so excited to go to vaccination sites over the last week to see all the moms so excited. I talked to little kids, told them that they're gonna be superheroes after they get their shots. But this is New York City. The infection rate is 1%, a little bit higher than 1%. Unbelievable, and that's another selling point in getting people back. Other parts of our state, I was in Buffalo a day or two ago talking about what's going on in the Finger Lakes, and Rochester and Southern Tier. They're approaching 9%. A lot of that, primarily, are people who refuse to get vaccinated. And the parents who won't get vaccinated, I don't have any hope that they're going to get their kids vaccinated here. So this is the dynamic we're dealing with. And why I did not want to have a one broad approach that covers the whole state, I want to make sure that we're continuing the masks in schools a little longer, that's important, but also the rest of the state may have some different dynamics going on in terms of protocols. That is the reality I'm dealing with here is two different philosophies on how we address this. So bottom line, Bill, to answer your question, yes. Walk in, tell somebody you feel at risk, get that booster now, especially as we head into the holidays. We are seeing more hospitalizations from breakthrough cases from people who were vaccinated. I was just talking to a senator the other day who was on the phone with the health department who just had a breakthrough case, a young person. So that is what I'm advising everybody do. Get out there, don't wait any longer, get those appointments so you can enter the holidays feeling more secure that you're protected from this virus. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, there, uh, Olivia, one of our YP AVD members. Hi, thank you so much, Governor, for taking the time with everyone today. Um, and thank you, Abney, for bringing us all back together. Um, I wanted to ask about the opportunities that the infrastructure bill funding will unlock for you to implement policies and programs around the care economy and social infrastructure that will uplift communities throughout the state. Um, things like the nursing pipeline program you talked about, child care, access to remote education, um, and tools for that, both for educators and learners. Thanks. Excellent question. I do hope that, the, that Congress will have the courage 
to do what is right, and not just with the infrastructure, but also ensuring that we deal with the Build Back Better overall to talk about more of the, the social infrastructure, the human infrastructure, because you mentioned a couple of issues that are deeply personal to me. The child care crisis has been with us for a long time, but this pandemic created something far worse, a crisis on steroids. I went to more child care centers during this pandemic than probably anybody in the state. Senator Gillibrand and I traveled the state. And so many parents struggling even before the pandemic, child care centers, many of them were shuttered, many of them only had half capacity. They didn't have a place to go and the affordability was off the charts. And simultaneously, child care workers, these direct care workers, our nursing home workers, they are not paid what they are deserved. Child care workers, early child, they are the first teachers for our children. They're not babysitters, they're educators for our children, and they need to be treated like that. So my budget's actually gonna address the child care crisis, just so you can be aware of that, but also paid family leave. Just this past week, we signed a bill that expanded who can be eligible for paid family leave, allowing siblings to take care of each other. My sister is in the audience somewhere. Hi, Sheila. Uh, she wants to see me, she has to go to Ebony's speeches. Uh, <laughs> But we, but, we, but we share responsibility for taking care of an older father. We also know that there may come a time we have to take care of each other, and paid family leave will now cover that. So these are issues that are deeply important to me as a human being, but also as someone who is part of that sandwich generation where you're taking care of elderly parents and you're taking care of children and someday hopefully grandkids. It's just a little message for my kids. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I addressed it properly, but I, we, we have a very solid program that's going to be announced, not today, but into, into our State of the State address. We do have a plan to spend that money. We did get millions and millions of child care dollars out the door that were pent up. We just took care of that. I did a Zoom call last night with Senator Brisport, who is the chair of the uh, Committee on Children and Families. And he was talking to providers around the state. We were, we were talking about how we're getting the existing money out. But I'm hoping there's more, because what we have is not enough to deal with the crisis that is ongoing. I mean, parents, mother in my office yesterday said, I have to go home because my daughter was just sent home for 10 days because she was exposed to somebody at school. So there's, it's not settled yet. We still need to provide the assistance for these parents, primarily mothers, so they can feel they can get back to work, the kids are taken care of, they're in good hands. And I'll lastly, lastly say, I've also put this on employers. I have said for a long time, back when I was starting out my family as working for Senator Moynihan, I had two children. I had no one to watch them. I ended up giving up a job I love because there were no childcare options in a city that I, was, I had no relatives in. Fast forward to today. That should not be the case anymore. We should be living in an era where we actually respect this and that employers understand that this is something, it's not just a family's problem, it's a problem for society, and it's also a problem for the economy. I can't tell you how many business owners in this city have said, we're not going to be back until we can figure out the child care issue for the parents. I loved hearing that because I felt some sense of ownership from the employers as well, that they have to offer flexible hours. Or my dream scenario, so when people want economic development assistance from the state, we're asking them, where's the child care center on your site? You're putting in a million square feet. Where are you putting the child care center? I'll tell you, that'll be the best, best way you can recruit employees. <laughs> Parents of any gender, they will want to be there because it's not just the moms, it's the fathers, it's others who want to be able to check in. So I think that is the game changer. New York City, you're paying attention. You start putting child care sites in your businesses or putting together a consortium in your area where you bring together one site that all the other businesses support, you'll have no problem recruiting, recruiting the best, talented, hardest working people, and I'm referring to women. So that's, that's your advice. <laughs> Thank you for that, Governor. I'm going to, I'm going to end with one final question. Uh, you have a primary ahead of you. What? <laughs> uh, what is your path to victory? Um, first of all, I am humbled to be the governor of the state of New York. It is something I'm prepared for. I'm confident in my ability to lead. But there is a democratic process that requires us to engage in an election, a primary. But I'm also very focused on the general election. 
I was elected as a Democrat in Congress in the most Republican district in the state of New York. There is an anxiety out there, a frustration. And we saw this in Virginia. We saw it too close in New Jersey. We saw what happened in Nassau County. And I feel as the leader of the Democratic Party for the state of New York, which positions me as a national Democratic leader, we need to start speaking to the people who feel that we've lost it. We're not speaking to the, the middle class families, the struggling farmers, the small businesses. We have to start letting people know that we're fighting for all of them just as I have my entire life. So I believe that the governing that I will accomplish, the new approach that people are delighted with, I can't tell you when people say it, it is a breath of fresh air, and that will never change. That is what I'm hardwired to do. So they'll see our accomplishments. They'll start feeling tangible results in their lives because of the new leadership in Albany. And there'll be no reason for them to change that. But I'll also keep reminding everyone, it's not about this primary. It's about being victorious next November, not just governor's race, but I want to be there to help make sure that Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi keep their positions. Otherwise, Joe Biden will be hamstrung for the last two years of his administration, just as it happened when I was in Congress. Barack Obama had to deal two last years with Republican majorities, and nothing got done. So I see the big picture. I will win this primary. I am known all over this state, and I have strong support from Long Island, upstate, and many of the bureaus, and I'm not giving up on any borough. I am going into every place and saying, this is who I am. I appreciate your faith in me, and I will fight like hell for you every single day. Thank you for your faith in me, and thank you all for coming this morning. Thank you, everybody. How are you doing? Thank you, sir.